Lonesome Traveler, The Railroad Earth, Part 1. There was a little alley in San Francisco, back of the Southern Pacific Station at 3rd and Townsend, in red brick of drowsy, lazy afternoons, with everybody at work and offices in the air, you feel the impending rush of their commuter frenzy, as soon they'll be charging en masse from Market and Samson, buildings on foot and in buses, and all well-dressed through working man Frisco of Walker. Truck drivers and even the poor grime but marked Third Street of lost bums, even Negroes so hopeless and long left east and meanings of responsibility and try that now all they do is stand there spitting in the broken glass, sometimes 50 in one afternoon against one wall at Third and Howard, and here's all these Milbray and San Carlos necktied, necktied producers of commuters of America and steel civilization rushing by with San Francisco chronicles and green call bulletins. Not even enough time to be disdainful. They've got to catch 130, 132, 134, 136, all the way up to 146, till the time of evening supper in homes of the railroad earth when high in the sky the magic stars ride above the following hot shot phrase trains. It's all in California. It's all a sea. I swim out of it in afternoons of sun, hot meditation in my jeans with head on handkerchief on brakeman's lantern or, if not working, on books. I look up at blue sky of perfect lost purity and feel the warp of wood of old America beneath me and have insane conversations with Negroes in several story windows above and everything is pouring in. The switching moves of boxcars and that little alley which is so much like the alleys of Lowell and I hear far off in the sense of coming night that engine calling our mountains. But it was that beautiful cut of clouds I could always see above the little SP alley, puffs floating by from Oakland or the gate of Marin to the north or San Jose south, the clarity of Cal to break your heart. It was the fantastic drowse and drum hum of lum mum afternoon, nothing to do, old Frisco, with end of land sadness. The people, the alley full of trucks and cars of businesses near abouts, and nobody knew or far from cared who I was all my life, 3,500 miles from birth, opened up, and at last belonged to me in great America. Now it's light in Third Street, the keen little neons, and also yellow bulb lights of impossible to believe flops with dark ruined shadows moving back of torn yellow shades with a degenerate china with no money the cat's in annie's alley the flop comes on moans rolls the street is loaded with darkness Blue sky above with stars hanging high over old hotel roofs and blowers of hotels moaning out dusts of interior. The grime inside the word and mouths falling on tooth by tooth. The reading room, tick tock big clock with creak chair and slant boards. And old faces looking up over rimless spectacles bought in some West Virginia or Florida or Liverpool, England pawn shop long, long before I was born. And across rains, they've come to the end of the land, sadness, end of the world, gladness, all you San Francisco's will have to fall eventually and burn again. But I'm walking and one night a bum fell in the hole of the construction job where they're tearing a sewer by day, the husky Pacific and electric youths in torn jeans who work there often, I think of going up to some of them, like, say, blonde ones with wild hair and torn shirts and say, you ought to apply for the railroad. It's much easier work. You don't stand around the street all day and you get much more money, much more pay. But this bum fell in the hole. You saw his foot stick out. A British MG, also driven by some eccentric, once backed into the hole. And as I came home from a long Saturday afternoon, local to Hollister out of San Jose, miles away across virtuous fields of prune and juice joys, here's this British MG packed and legs up, wheels up into a pit, and bums and cops standing around right outside the coffee shop. It was the way they fenced it, but he never had the nerve to do it due to the fact that he had no money and nowhere to go. And oh, his father was dead. And oh, his mother was dead. And oh, his sister was dead. And oh, his whereabout was dead and dead. 
But and then at that time also I lay in my room on long Saturday afternoons listening to Jumpin' George with my fifth of toke, no tea, and just under the sheets laugh to hear the crazy music. Mama, he treats your daughter mean. Mama, Papa, and don't you come in here, I'll kill you, etc. Getting high by myself in room glooms and all wondrous knowing about the Negro, the essential American out there, always finding a solace, his meaning in the Fellaheen street and not in abstract morality. And even when he has a church, you see the pasture out front bowing to the ladies on the make you hear his great vibrant voice on the sunny sunday afternoon sidewalk full of sexual vibrato saying why yes ma'am but the gospel do say that man was born of woman's womb and no and so by that time i come crawling out of my warm sack and hit the street when i see the railroad ain't gonna call me till 5 a.m sunday morn probably for a local out of bayshore in fact always for a local out of bayshore and i go to the way bar out of the, all the wild bars in the world, the one and only Third and Howard, and there I go in and drink with the madmen, and if I get drunk, I get. The horror come up to me in there the night I was there with Al Buckle and said to me, you want to play with me tonight, Jim? And, and I didn't think I had enough money and la later told this to Charlie Lowe, and he laughed and said, how do you know she wanted money? Always take the chance that she might be out just for love or just out for love. You know what I mean, man, don't be a sucker. She was a good looking doll and said, how you like a Uliaku with me, mom? And I stood there like a jerk and in fact, Bought drink, got drink drunk that night, and in the 299 club, I was hit by the proprietor of the band breaking up the fight before I had a chance to decide to hit him back, which I didn't do. And out on the street, I tried to rush back in, but they had locked the door and were looking at me through the forbidden glass and the door with faces like under sea. I should have played with her shoe row. Despite the fact that I was a brake man making 600 a month, I kept going to the public restaurant on Howard Street, which was three eggs for 26 cents, two eggs for 21. This with toast, hardly no butter. Coffee, hardly no coffee and sugar rationed. Oatmeal with dash of milk and sugar, the smell of soured old shirts lingering above the cooked pot steams as if they were making skid roll lumberjack stews out of San Francisco ancient Chinese mildewed laundries with poker games in the back among the barrels and the rats of the earthquake days. But actually the food, someone on the level of an old time 1890 or 1910 section gang cook of lumber camps far in the north with an old time pigtail Chinaman cooking it and cussing out those who did didn't like it. The prices were incredible, but one time I had the beef stew and it was absolutely the worst beef stew I ever ate. It was incredible, I tell you. And as they often did that to me, it was with the most intensest regret that I tried to convey to the geek back of counter what I wanted, but he was a tough son of a bitch. Ah, t -t. I thought the counterman was kind of queer, especially handed Roughly, the hopeless drool drunks. What now you doing? You think you can come in here and cut like that? For God's sake, act like a man wants you and eat or get out. T -t -t -t. I always did wonder what a guy like that was doing in a place like that because, but why some sympathy in his horny heart for the busted Rex? All up and down the street were restaurants like the public catering exclusively to bums of the black, winos with no money, who found 21 cents left over from wine pan handlings and so stumbled in for their third or fourth touch of food in a week as sometimes they didn't eat at all. And so you'd see them in the corner puking white liquid, which was a couple of quarts of rancid sauternes rot gut or sweet white sherry. And they had nothing on their stomachs. Most of them had one leg or were on crutches and had bandages around their feet from nicotine and alcohol poisoning together. And one time finally up on my up third near market across the street from Brains when in early 1952 I lived on Russian Hill and didn't quite dig the complete horror and humor of Railroad's Third Street. A bum, a thin, sickly little bum like Anton Abraham lay face down on the pavement with crutch aside and some old remnant newspaper sticking out and it seemed to me he was dead. 
I looked closely to see if he was breathing, and he was not. Another man with me was looking down, and we agreed he was dead, and soon a cop came over and took and agreed and called the wagon. The little wretch weighed about 50 pounds in his bleeding count and was stone mackerel, snot nose, cold dead as a bleeding door now. I tell you, and who could notice but other half-dead, dead bums, 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 dead, dead, times, x times, x times, all dead bums, forever dead, with nothing, and all finished and out there. And this was the clientele in the public hair restaurant where I ate many's the morn, a three-egg breakfast with almost dry toast and oatmeal and a little saucer of and thin sickly dishwasher coffee, all to save 14 cents. So in my little book, probably I could make a notation of the day and prove that I could live comfortably in America while working seven days a week and earning 600 a month. I could live on less than 17 a week, which with my rent of 420 was okay, as I also to spend money to eat and sleep sometimes on the other end of my Watsonville chain gang run, but preferred most times to sleep free of charge and uncomfortable in cambooses of the crummy rack. My 26 cent breakfast, my pride. And that incredible semi-queer counterman who dished out the food, threw it at you, slammed it, had a languid, frank expression straight in your eyes like a 1930s lunch, lunch cart heroine in Steinbeck and at the steam table itself labored coolly a junk, junky looking Chinese with an actual stocking in his hair as if they'd just shanghaied him off the foot of Commercial Street before the ferry building was up but forgot it was 1952. Dreamed it was 1860 Gold Rush Frisco and on rainy days you felt they had ships in the back room. I take walks up Harrison and the boom crash of truck traffics towards the glorious girders of the Oakland Bay Bridge that you could see after climbing Harrison Hill, a little like radar machine of eternity in the sky, huge in the blue by pure clouds crossed, gulls, idiot cars streaking to destinations on its undino boom across schmosh waters fucked up by winds and news of San Rafael storms and flashboats. There, oh, I always came, walked, and negotiated whole friscos in one afternoon from the overlooking hills of the high Fillmore, where Orient-bound vessels you can see on drowsy Sunday mornings of pool hall goof, like after a whole night playing drums in a jam session and a morn in the hall of acoustics, I went by the rich homes of old ladies supported by daughters of, or female secretaries with immense ugly gargoyle of Frisco millions fronts of other days and way below is the blue passage of the gate the Alcatraz mad rock the mouths of Tamal Pais San Pablo Bay Sausalito sleeping hemming the rock and bush over yonder and the sweet white ships cleanly cutting a path to Sasebo over Harrison and down to the Embarcadero and around Telegraph Hill and up the back of Russian Hill and down to the play streets of Chinatown and down Kearney back across Market to Third and my wild night neon twinkle fate there, ah, and then finally at dawn of a Sunday and they did call me that eternity, the immense girders of Oakland Bay still haunting me and all that eternity too much to swallow and not knowing who I am at all, but like a big, plump, long-haired baby waking up in the dark, trying to wonder who I am. The door knocks, and it's the desk keeper of the flop hotel with silver rims and white hair and clean clothes and sickly pot belly said he was from Rocky Mount and looked like, yes, he had been desk clerk of the Nash Buncombe Association Hotel down there in 50 successive heat wave summers without the sun and only palmos of the lobby with cigar crutches in the albums of the south and him with his dear mother waiting in a buried log cabin of graves with all that mash pass history underground afoot with the stain of the bear 
the blood of the tree and cornfields long plowed under and negroes whose voices long faded from the middle of the wood and the dog barked his last this man had voyagered to the west coast too like all other loose american elements and was pale and sixty and complaining of sickness might at one time been a handsome squire to women with money but now a forgotten clerk and maybe spent a little time in jail for a few forgeries or harmless cons and might also have been a railroad clerk and might have wept and might have never made it and that day, I'd say, he saw the bridge girders up over the hill of traffic of Harrison like me and woke up mornings with same lost, is now beckoning on my door and breaking in the world on me, and he is standing on the frayed carpet of the, la the hall, all worn down by black steps of sunken old men for the last forty years since earthquake and the toilet stained. Beyond the last toilet bowl and the last stink and stain, I guess, yes, is the end of the world, the bloody end of the world. So now, knocks on my door and wake up, saying, How, what, how, Powell, like howl of the knavery they're making, act and won't let me slave it. Where they do, one doubt with this thing that comes swimming around my dooring in the mouth of the night, and there everything knows that I have no mother, and no sister, and no father, and no but sostel, but not crib. I get up and sit and says, How, whoa, whoa. And he says, Telephone. And I have to put on my jeans, heavy with knife, wallet. I look closely at my railroad watch, hanging on my little door flicker of closet door face to me, ticking, ticking, silent the time. It says 4.30 a.m. of a Sunday morn. I go down the carpet of the skid row hall in jeans and with no shirt and yes, with shirt tails hanging gray work shirt and pick up phone and ticky sleep night desk with cage and spittoons and keys hanging and old towels piled clean ones but frayed at edges and bearing names of every hotel of the moving prime. On the phone is the crew clerk. Caraway? Yeah. Caraway is going to be the Sherman local at 7 a.m. this morning. Sherman local, right. Out of Bayshore, you know the way. Yeah, you had that same job last Sunday, okay, Caraway? And we mutually hang up, and I say to myself, okay, it's the Bayshore bloody old, dirty, hagless old, coveted old madman Sherman who hates me so much, especially when we were at Redwood Junction kicking boxcars, and he always insists I work the rear end. There was one year, man, it would be easier for me to follow pot, but I work rear, and he wants me to be right there with a block of wood when a car or cut of cars kicked stops, so they won't roll down that incline and start catastrophes. Oh, well, anyway, I'll be learning eventually to like the railroad, and Sherman will like me someday. And anyway, another day, another dollar.